buongiorno a tutti, benvenuti al Parlamento europeo, è con grande piacere che vi porgo a nome di tutti i deputati, mio personale, il benvenuto nella nostra aula, anche se in una modalità diversa, nuova, inedita. Voglio ringraziare il programma Euroscuola per il suo impegno, per incoraggiare voi giovani a parlare di Europa, ad esprimere la vostra opinione sulla democrazia europea, sui diritti fondamentali, sui nostri valori comuni e su tutte le tematiche che vi stanno a cuore. Stiamo vivendo una situazione straordinaria, inaspettata, che ci ha condotto in questi mesi a prendere delle decisioni senza precedenti, ad adeguare i nostri strumenti, a definire delle nuove politiche che corrano di pari passo con le esigenze e le necessità di tutti i cittadini europei. La democrazia non può essere sospesa, soprattutto nel mezzo di una crisi drammatica come questa, il vostro incontro oggi nella prova palese. È un grande piacere vedere tanti ragazzi, tanti giovani come voi che si interessano all'Europa, che dedicano il loro tempo, le loro energie, il loro cuore a sostegno di un'Europa più forte, unita, solidale. Oggi con gli strumenti e i fondi messi a disposizione dall'Unione abbiamo la possibilità di progettare quella nuova Europa, un'Europa che sia più equa, più verde, più digitale, proiettata verso il futuro. Ed è essenziale che voi siate gli attori chiave, perché tante sfide attento, attendono proprio voi, le nuove generazioni. Ed è nostro dovere sentire il peso sulle spalle fin da subito di queste vostre necessità. Today, 86 schools and about 2,850 schools all over Europe are participating. We're glad to see and curious to see from how many countries you're joining us today. Normally, I said you come to Strasbourg and that's the perfect occasion in order to meet other students and to discuss. You can ask yourself where you're from and you can exchange on political issues, you can find solutions, you can debate. That's what we do today in this online event and I'm very glad that you all participate today. Thank you once again for organizing such a delightful event for us young people and we would like to ask a question about what measures uh, are cr most crucial for the European Union to solve the uh, global pandemic crisis. Well, um Of course, we have to solve the health problem uh, in the first place uh, through vaccination, through testing, through um, sanitary measures, etc. This, as I mentioned before, is actually competence of the member states, but of course the European Union needs to coordinate, needs to support, um, etc. And the other part is, is the economic one, uh, where the European Union is doing a lot, where we really invest a lot of money to boost um, our, our economy, to keep things going, because this is, is really what we learned from the financial crisis. Uh, more than 10 years ago, that once the economy has really dropped and, 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 and companies have closed, it's so difficult to, um, to, re, uh, to, to get going again, to reopen. So what we're actually trying to do is to support um, the, the economy and, as I said, keep people in their jobs um, for the sake of, of the people and, and the families, etc., but also for the sake of, of economy still being at whole, sort of. And we are seeing success there. Um, we, we, we really believe that um, once we have the vaccination more or less done everywhere, that, that we really have a good base of, of restarting. We see that in the economic figures. Yeah, Ms. Bali, thank you very much for your time. Now, you talked about the deficits in the European Union right now. Is Euroscola the only way of allowing civil society access to the European Union? What about the right of initiative to influence legislation in the European Parliament? How can words become deeds? Um, how can we uh, leverage the advantages of the European Union? 
Um, As things currently stand, when we pass laws, we've got the commission, which is more or less akin to the government in a member state, which can put forward a proposal or a bill, and then you have the parliament and the council. So the council brings together the member states, of course, who then pass those laws. So the commission is then out of the room at that stage. So you've got three important institutions which are interlinked and none really dominates the other because the council can't put forward, it can only decide commission can't decide anything, can only propose. Now, of course, European Parliament would really like to have its own right of initiative, you know, so we could start the ball rolling. Why would that be the case? Well, first of all, we feel that we are the only institution in the European Union which is actually directly elected by the people of Europe. We represent the people in the European Union. And that, I think, also ties in with the fact that in many situations already, we really do think in a more European way. We're more progressive, I would say, than the other two institutions. I mean, that might be a rather bold thing to say. But I think that that's what a lot of parliamentarians think, because you've got council representing the member states, and then you've got the commission um, made up of members who are appointed by the member states. So, you know, those two institutions really have got a national perspective, and we would say that the real Europeans well, you know, more or less. Um, we're the real Europeans, um, and so we would like more prerogatives, more rights, the right of initiative, if you like. Uh, and I think that there will be a lot of possibilities then for young people. I mean, we already have the European Youth Event, the I, which unfortunately, because of corona, was cancelled, but we've got this major conference on the future of Europe, which is finally getting underway, and that will give us an opportunity to hear from citizens as to how they wish the European Union to change. What do you think is the biggest threat to the EU or to EU democracy? Your answer, please. <laughs> Well, the biggest threat to democracy is that um, not all governments um, define the fundamental values of the European Union in the same way anymore. This is a change that we have seen within the last years. Uh, we do see some governments, in particular two, who, um, who suggest that, uh, for example, the rule of law um, shall be defined not um, the same in every member state, but um, according to history, to culture of every member state. And this is an extremely dangerous um, development because, of course, um, the way that you organize, for example, your justice or your parliament work can be very different in every member state. But as it was shown in the little film in the beginning, as I already said, the goal has to be the same, which is a, a fundamental separation of powers, a functioning control of government. And unfortunately, there are some governments in the European Union that do not want to be controlled anymore. And this is a huge threat to democracy in these states. That is the business of the people there. But it's also a threat to European democracy because um, we need this, this common ground, which is enshrined in Article 2 of our treaties. So it's there, everybody agreed to it, and we have to stick to that. What makes me European? <sighs> That's a good, good question. And I think it's a very individual question. I think everybody has to reply to that for him or herself. Um, maybe I'm, I'll make it personal again. I, f for me, I'm a different generation than you are, of course. Um, um, my parents were both born during the war. My father is born in 35, well, uh, before the war, but, but he, he lived the war as a kid. Uh, my mother born in 40. And my father is British, my mother is German. So I have both sides of the family who actually op opposed themselves uh, during, during the war, opposed each other. I married um, a man who is half Spaniard and half Dutch two countries who have also fought wars against each other for centuries. So for me, I must admit, um, I have two sons aged uh, 17 and 24. And, and for me, this idea 
of, of them being a generation, you being a generation, that will not go to war. How is it possible for humanitarian values and the sense of solidarity to be strengthened through education at times of social distancing? How do you decide who you want to help? I mean solidarity. What is the next step to help the nations which need economical help? Quelle sorte d'aide les pays de l'Union européenne peuvent-ils apporter aux autres pays en crise et quel impact ceci peut-elle avoir sur le donneur d'aide et le receveur de cette aide. Comment the European Union benefits from a common public health agency? Who to help? Well, the one who needs to be helped. So the Parliament uh, has adopted a series of resolutions, at least three or four resolutions since the start of the crisis one year ago. And most recently, uh, a few days ago, mid-February, the Parliament adopted a resolution on the impact of the Covid crisis on youth. So I think uh, this is where also uh, the Parliament is supporting Commission and asking Commission for more initiatives. You may know there is a youth strategy portal uh, where you can get information on projects. So the ones who want to help can uh, draw lessons and best practices out of the projects that were launched several, in several countries. You have projects of uh, young people helping elder people, for instance, or helping other uh, students and showing solidarity. So I think it's a good platform to exchange best practices and information. Uh, the Commission also decided to add 530 million to the European Solidarity Fund. Uh, which is a key tool in that respect, and also to, to give guidelines uh, to the European uh, Solidarity Corps in times of COVID. So uh, if you pay, uh, have a look at the EP resolution of mid-February, uh, of the 10th of February, you can see all the Parliament is asking for uh, young people to benefit from in this time of COVID. And also, I think going to the Commission platform and the new strategy platform, you could uh, suggest programs or initiatives and uh, draw uh, experience out of the uh, projects led in other member states. Uh, so I think uh, these are just examples of what can be done. And uh, you can go uh, via the Erasmus program or you can go via the European Solidarity Corps programs and the national agencies together with the EU agencies uh, to put forward proposals and ideas. Should the EP be more free in reminding these countries that they have certain legal obligations to assist and protect refugees by accepting them in their countries? Thank you for your question. Um... In my previous capacity, I worked in a committee, the Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs, which was in charge of asylum and migration policies. So we followed all that had to do with the Dublin regulation. And as I mentioned when starting, there is an article in the treaty, Article 80, that is specifically on solidarity in migration, asylum and borders policy. I can only regret that member states tend to forget that article and don't use it very often. So I think this is definitely uh, one way to pursue. And as you say, uh, there are legal obligations on asylum policies in particular, not only EU law obligations, but international law obligations and the uh, UN conventions also. And in the whole debate on migration, asylum and solidarity, sometimes the specificities of asylum are being forgotten. So, and we know how much Greece has been exposed to such situation because of its geographical situation. And I visited uh, Greece several times uh, on these topics. And I fully share your view that more solidarity is needed between member states on this. Uh, Commissioner Johansson, the commissioner responsible for asylum and migration policies, has put forward a new project, a new pact on asylum and migration that member states and the parliament are discussing now. I can only but hope that uh, they will be able to conclude, conclude negotiations soon uh, and that uh, situation will be clear because we know how difficult and how deadly the situation in the Mediterranean is. Thank so you. So it is a, a very, it's, it's a key area for the uh, demonstration and that uh, the EU should show evidence on solidarity. It's time to decide you will have one minute to vote and I will use the official words.
by the president normally sitting in this chair, he says the vote is open. Yes, now it's up to you. You can vote, you can leave, um, you can give us your opinion. Which idea is the most important one for you? Yes, the vote is still open. We think we have a couple of more seconds to go and then we will know the final result and let you know in a second. But now you can still keep on voting and we see that you're still voting. We're almost at 500. Can we reach 500? And I think one minute is now done. The vote is closed and we have a clear winner, Stephanie. Yes, we have a clear winner. We have a clear winner. We had 519 votes and the clear winner, winner is teach young people more about politics and life in general with 41%. I know that uh, today's uh, theme was about uh, solidarity in, ta in times of emergency. Of course, uh, uh, this is uh, probably one of the priorities now, how to strengthen this uh, solidarity uh, when uh, it's obvious that, this, uh, that it is even uh, more needed than uh, in, uh, in normal uh, uh, times. If there is a way to, to weigh out uh, from this uh, COVID crisis, it's obvious that this uh, way must must be uh, found through solidarity, through joint action, to doing the things uh, together. We are seeing this, for example, now with this uh European uh, vaccination uh, campaign. Uh, we see also this uh, with uh, all the decisions taken by the European Union to help the member states, uh, to help the citizens, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to cope with the economic, uh, with the social consequences uh, of this uh, coronavirus crisis. These are uh, the concrete ways to show what solidarity means. Solidarity is not just a word, it's not a, a value uh, in the treaty or in the Charter for Fundamental Rights, it's more than a concept, uh, it, but you have to show this uh, through the facts. And I think that in these uh, last months and right now, the European Union needs really uh, showing what uh, solidarity uh, uh, means. You know that the European Parliament has put in place a campaign called Together.eu. Uh, That's a website as well, website and that permet, uh, allows you not only to participate passively, in other words, to find information about the European Parliament, particularly about what the European Parliament is doing, but also it allows you to become activists and you can become lobbyists, if you like, for the European idea and try and move closer to what the European Parliament is doing. And you can obviously be more representative, particularly for young people who don't yet have an opportunity to vote at European elections, but particularly for those of you who are very keen to follow what is going on at European level. Merci beaucoup et bonne continuation.